In this video, I'm sharing my first impressions using the Octave software. In this video series on signal processing, we've been focusing so far on analog systems and signals, and I'm interested in whether we can use Octave to do some calculations in support of that. So Octave, or GNU Octave, is a high-level programming language for numerical computations. It's actually open source, and it's freely available under the GNU General Public License, or GPL. It's hard to talk about Octave without mentioning MATLAB. MATLAB is commercial software that's very common in the academic community, and I've been using it on and off for the last 18 years. It's a combination of schoolwork, teaching, research, R&D jobs. I've had a lot of experience with MATLAB. But why am I not choosing to use MATLAB uh, to demonstrate in this video series? Well, MATLAB is actually quite expensive if you're not uh, with an employer or at a university where it is included, where there's a site license that you can make use of. It's quite expensive for someone to just pick it up and start using it. So individual personal use licenses run from about $100 to $150, depending on whether you're a student. If you want to use MATLAB for research or even to make educational videos for YouTube as an individual, then you need at least an academic license, which runs over $500. And commercial licenses run into thousands of dollars per person. Now Octave is generally considered to be a clone of MATLAB and it's free. So we'll run with that. So Octave is free to download. I'll include the link in the description. I actually tried Octave before many, many years ago. So during my master's study, I had downloaded it to try it out, compare it with MATLAB. At that time, it was only command line based. There was no graphical user interface. And since I was used to using a graphical user interface with MATLAB, I found it quite difficult to get into. So at that time, I kind of dropped it. So for this video, I wanted to try out a couple of tasks that relate to content that I've been covering in my videos on analog signal processing and just see can we calculate them in Octave. I'm interested to see how far can I get just based on my knowledge of MATLAB syntax and, and its interface, if I can just readily translate that into using Octave. Okay, so now I have Octave open after I've installed it. I'm using Octave version 8.3. Yes, 8.3. So this is uh, current as of August 2023, I believe. So it's a fairly recent update. Um, if you're used to using MATLAB, you'll see that this interface is very minimalist. It's very clean. There's not a whole lot of stuff here, um, but the main components are still the same. They're still very similar to MATLAB. So we have our command window here in the middle where we can enter commands. We have our file browser where we can see the files that are currently in our working directory. We have our workspace. This is where we can read information about any variables that we've created. And we also have the command history. It keeps a record of the commands that are called from the command window. Now the command window is here. We have immediate access to the documentation. There's a separate tab uh, down here at the bottom. So we can readily get to all the uh, help documentation that's available. We have the variable editor. So this is sort of a basic uh, spreadsheet type software. If we have specific variables created, we can go in and inspect them here. And I assume we can modify them as well, though I haven't tried that yet. Um, and then we have the editor. So here's where we can create uh, scripts and functions uh, to run code all at once. Um, so I've, I've tried to work through creating some scripts to demonstrate three different things that uh, we commonly do in the course I teach on signal processing when we're looking at analog signals and systems. And so those are using symbolic math to try to find the output of a linear time invariant LTI analog system. Um, next, trying to plot the frequency response of a system based on the transfer function coefficients. And third, to try to do a pull zero plot. Now in MATLAB, all three of those things require uh, different toolboxes. So we need symbolic math, the signal processing, and uh, the control systems toolbox. Here in Octave, they have uh, packages, which do a lot of the same thing. The biggest difference I've found between the packages and the toolboxes is that even if we have the functions installed on our computer, we need to load them in separately. So I think that contributes to why the software is quite lean in terms of RAM when you open it up, because it doesn't have any of the packages preloaded. You have to load them. You need at least one function call to load those at runtime, and then you can use them in future calls. Uh, if I bring up my task manager here, I won't show it on screen. I have three packages loaded and it's still taking less than 200 megabytes of memory, which is very low. Um, you can't open MATLAB without that taking up a couple of gigabytes of RAM, I don't think. So yes, the installation was quite easy. This interface is quite clean, even here within the editor, 
we don't get as many options in terms of being able to do things like have sections. Uh, I don't see any quick commands for adding comments. So if I like try to comment out a bunch of code all at once, I don't know if Control R will work. Ah, oh, I think maybe it did. Okay, it uses um, the double hash marks. There was no button that I could find to do this. And now I've commented code that I didn't want to comment out. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove those hashes. Uh, there are slight differences in Octave code and MATLAB code. I think one of them is in Octave, you can use a hash as a command symbol. That doesn't work in MATLAB. Anyway, I'll go through the, the three bits of code that I put together to repeat some functionality that's very similar to what I do in MATLAB. First, I have this symbolic test. I had to add a command to load the symbolic package. Now, since I've already done that and I've already run this script since I opened the software, I actually don't need this call again. So I'm gonna comment it out just to demonstrate that I don't need it anymore. But what I've done is I've created uh, symbolic parameters. These are from the functions available in the symbolic package. I've defined a frequency. I've created an input signal, which is just a trigonometric function. I created a cosine. I have a very basic first order low pass filter as my transfer function. And then the calculations I have here. So I'm applying uh, the Laplace transform. So now that I'm in Laplace domain, I can multiply the input by the transfer function to get the output. And then I apply inverse Laplace transform uh, to get the output back in the time domain. And then what I've done is try to plot these. Um, I had some trouble with code I would normally use working in MATLAB to uh, convert my symbolic functions into uh, double precision functions. But what I've at least found is that they have these symbolic functions available called easy plot. And that lets me plot symbolic functions for a given domain. So I've done that here, plotting the X and Y. So the input and the output from time zero to time 10. So I'll go ahead now and run this uh, code for symbolic math by pressing the green triangle up here, which is the play button and let that run. The symbolic engine will be uh, running and then it will do the work to make the plot. Okay, so we get our plot right here. Uh, the, the functions that I called when I made the plot included two calls to easy plot and uh, one for the input X and one for the output Y. I had trouble getting both of them to plot at the same time. You can probably get it to work, but this seemed to work fine. Um, I'm calling them separately with a hold on in between so it wouldn't overwrite um, the first plot with the second one. I define the axis with this called axis. So that along X from zero to 10 and along Y from minus one to plus one. And then I define my legend values with a call to the legend function. Let me just bring the figure back up. Now within the Octave interface, I don't have many options to actually manipulate this like I would in MATLAB. In MATLAB, um, it's easy to do things like change the formatting of the lines, add axis labels, um, change the scaling that's, that's being shown. I have a fairly rudimentary set of options here. They give me the ability to toggle the grid on and off. I can toggle the box. I can add annotations. I can zoom and pan and rotate, um, but that's about it. Anything else I want to do, I need to include additional commands to do that. It seems that the commands that I can use are quite comparable, if not identical to the ones used in MATLAB for things like uh, adjusting the title, adjusting the labels and so on. Um, the title, it appears to be the symbolic expression for the last thing that was plotted. So in this case, this is the equation for my output Y. If I just go to the command window and go to the call the title function and give that a string, let's just give this a silly, silly title here. We can see that we've changed it. So now it says my plot title. In any case, this seems to work reasonably well with, with a, a few different functions. So the easy plot, I don't, I'm not sure if that's available in MATLAB. I think the MATLAB equivalent would be fplot uh, for being able to do these kinds of figures. Um, but the symbolic math itself seems to be working as I was, would expect. Now I'm gonna look at plotting a frequency response given the coefficients of a transfer function. So transfer functions in the S domain, we can usually write those as a ratio of polynomials of powers of S and the B and A vectors are referred to the coefficients of those polynomials in decreasing order. So here B is equal to one, that would mean that the numerator polynomial is just one. A is a vector with values one, two, and one. So that would mean that we have a denominator polynomial that is S squared plus two S plus one. Uh, because I'm using the FREC S function, this is the one for calculating the frequency response. 
I have to load in the signal package. So I put the call up here to load that package. Um, and I create a new figure, I make that plot. Um, I have to specify a range. So by default in MATLAB, this kind of function, you could just give it the numerator and denominator uh, coefficients and it would come up with a range for you if you didn't provide one. Here you need to give a range. The documentation for this function is very brief. It's, it's just these few lines right here. Um, but you do need to provide uh, a, a frequency argument at the end. Um, the example they give here, it's a set of points. So in the code that I've written, I've defined this, uh, a range of frequencies from zero to 10 ratings per second. I'm gonna go ahead and run this now. And we do get the plot. So we, we get both a magnitude plot and a phase plot. Um, again, we have the same limitations in terms of how we can interact with the figures. So most details, if you want to change them, you'd have to go and use separate command calls to, to make those changes. I'm just going to see if I close this now, if I change this to a number, like if I say 100, will that still work? And no, it doesn't like that at all. What it's done, it's only evaluated the frequency at 100 radians per second. So in MATLAB, a call like this, you would get 100 um, automatically generated frequency values over a range that the that MATLAB thinks is appropriate. Here, uh, this third argument to frag S has to be the scalar in this case, or vector, a range of values that you want to evaluate the frequency response for. If we go to the command, window, you'll see I actually got a warning from running that most recently. So it, it didn't like the fact that I only gave it one uh, frequency value, but it still worked and it still plotted it. I just couldn't plot a line. It just plotted a dot. So that's it for the frequency response example. Finally, I want to show this one here with uh, the control package. This is for plotting a pull zero plot. Um, there is a control package that I've already loaded in, so I haven't included the call here, but it would just be pkg load control. Again, we are working with a transfer function in the S domain, but now we're creating a control object instead of just dealing with the numerator and denominator polynomials. So I've created an A and a B. I've made this B first order in order to make it a bit more interesting in the pole zero plot, because when B was just a one, then there's no actual uh, zero in the transfer function. I've written this as one and then zero now, so that we do have a zero in our system. I use the tf function, so this is the same uh, notation that I would use in MATLAB to create a control systems object. So here we're creating a control systems object h. Then I'm creating a new figure and I'm using the pz map function. In MATLAB I would use pz plot. Uh, that doesn't seem to be available here, but here we have pz map, and that seems to work just fine. So I'm going to go ahead and try running this, and here we go. We get a pole zero map. Now this is a system that has two poles at s equal to minus one, and we do have an x here for those poles. I don't see readily anything that indicates that this is actually two poles and not a single pole, but for the purposes of this example, I can, I can see that the function is, is working as I would expect it to. We have a zero here at the origin, and that's what we would expect because we have a zero from the, the numerator polynomial. So that is it. I think from the command window, we didn't get any extra warnings here, so that'll work fairly well. Uh, because all the code that I ran was scripts, so all the variables that have been created are in the workspace. So for example, if I select something like A, because A was a vector with three doubles in it, down here, let me close these other two, we do see here the individual values of that A vector. If I go and add a non-empty value to another element, we can see this actually changes the size of the A vector and including the new value that we added. There aren't many options here for manipulation. So you can, I can save the individual variables. Yeah, you can save those to a text file. The default file format, if you save variables and write them to file, is to write them as a text file. Um, so I find that really interesting. If I just go and show an example, let's just create a save call and we'll save that variable X. So I didn't specify a file extension here, but by default it will create a text file. It just won't have the txt at the end. I'm gonna overwrite that file now with the a vector, not x. We have some information about this created variable. It says when, it, when, when the file was created, it gives the names, it's matrix type, one row, four columns, and it gives those four values. If I say a is a vector that goes from one to 10, and now if I save a, if I bring up the text file again, here, now it's it's written it as a base limit increment format. So instead of writing each of the values from one to 10, it's saying we're going from one to 10 in increments of one. So I think that's a way of 
more efficiently storing the data if it's dealing with very large uh, variable types. Um, there are, of course, other more compact ways of storing this kind of information. Um, it is possible to write to a binary format. Octave does not have, or does not currently have the most recent version of the MATLAB data files. So you can save to a .mat file, but not version 7.3. Version 7.3 is a more recent uh, update to the MATLAB data types. I think it's more compact than previous versions. But just gives you a sense that there are some limitations in being able to, let's say, write data that you could read back and forth between the two types. You have to be careful with what sort of data format you're saving the information to. If I just look at the debugger very quickly, if I go back, say, to my symbolic function, um, I could click anywhere along here to the left of the line numbers. We have the red circle here where there's a breakpoint. If we right click, we can also do db stop if, so we could create a conditional uh, breakpoint. So I could make one, for example, let me just make it down here. <clears throat> I'll stop if omega is equal to three. So that will have a, an orange circle as a conditional breakpoint. Now, since we write that omega is equal to five, if I go ahead and run this now, it will skip this first breakpoint, but it will stop here because this is an unconditional breakpoint. So with the debugger, we can uh, scroll through our code line by line. While it's running, if we hover over variables that exist, we'll get a summary about them. Uh, obviously here for the symbolic function, well, not, it's not saying very much, it just says h equals three dots, but it, do, it does say, for example, that omega is equal to five. Uh, yeah, the symbolic functions, it doesn't seem all that useful for. But you can control uh, which lines of code run and you can follow the code if you need to, do, uh, to debug, to find an issue or wonder where calculation is being done. And uh, so the debugging functionality seems reasonably good um, and comparable to what I would, would have seen in, in MATLAB. But that's really all I wanted to, to check out uh, in this demo was to get my first impressions of using Octave. I think it's quite promising. Um, there's a lot of functionality here that's comparable to what I would expect in using, in using MATLAB. In some cases, some of the functions are a bit different, but I think those are ready workarounds. If I was working with Octave, it would be fairly easy to jump back and forth between MATLAB. The biggest issue is it would be difficult to take entire files of code, either scripts or functions, and they might not work one-to-one. -one. Um, but if you are familiar with these differences, it wouldn't be too difficult to, to jump back and forth between the two different uh, platforms. So I think that's quite promising, especially since this is a free tool uh, available under the GNU General Public License. So that means it's quite, uh, quite accessible. So that's quite promising. But anyway, that's it for this video. You can leave some feedback in the comments. It'd be interesting to know if, if there are other platforms that people might be interested in having me check out uh, and get a sense of what their functionality is with uh, these kinds of signal processing tools. In any case, you can subscribe if you want to catch more videos in the series. And uh, thank you for watching this video. See you next time.